of the lecture on in situ permeable reactive barriers. We're going to discuss barriers in general. We'll then go to the most common or most successful barrier, zero valent iron. We'll then talk about some examples from petroleum hydrocarbon research and pilot scale field studies. And we'll also talk about plumes that contain mixed contaminants, typically petroleum hydrocarbons and chlorinated solvents. Then we'll talk about future developments, where we might be going. Permeable reactive barriers provide a very good opportunity for people to invent new ways of cleaning up groundwater contamination. So what are permeable reactive barriers, or PRBs? Now here's a definition I found on the web. Key issue is that it's an in-situ remedial method, and it deals with groundwater, not the source. It involves some treatment of the contaminants and usually some management of the water flow. The idea is to treat the contaminants in situ, and if that proves to be cost effective and reliable, it seems to be a very good technology. Well, a number of approaches are available with, for plume remediation, and let's see where PRBs fit in. The standard approach has been pump and treat. Initially, that was thought a, to be a remedial technology, but the presence of NAPL sources, which dissolve very slowly, meant that we weren't really remediating the system. But in fact, we were controlling the plume. That is, properly designed pumping systems would intercept the plume and make sure contamination did not extend down gradient. On the other extreme is probably natural attenuation. We discussed that as monitor natural attenuation where natural processes prove to be suitable for remediating the plume. In between, there are a number of treatments. The best ones are semi-passive to passive and in situ. We can gain plume control and treatment, and typically permeable reactive barriers fit in this category. Well, where is the PRB status? Well, it's been around for a while. Some very good reviews, an exceptionally good one by Gillum, who was one of the founders of the technology. Uh, zero valent iron barriers are normally used to treat chlorinated solvents. And so this is a very good review of where we were uh, not too many years ago. Of course, the US EPA Clue Insight has information and the web pages of companies, of other organizations are uh, full of PRB case histories. How common is the technology? Well, the Superfund Remedy Report has been published. The most recent one covered up until only 2008. And here's a listing of the typical rem remedies that were selected in the 2005-2008 period. As you can see, the most common is still pump and treat. It is a good technology. Bioremediation and chemical treatments were also high on the list. The dominant treatment, of course, was monitored natural attenuation, and very few permeable reactive barriers were selected as remedies for Superfund sites. Not really sure why that is, perhaps because of the complexity and scale of those sites. Interestingly, in about 2000, I googled permeable reactive barriers and got about 800 hits. Last year, I again googled PRBs, and this time got about 400,000 hits. So certainly the technology has evolved and developed. Many of those hints are companies providing information or actually providing services to design and operate PRBs. The most common use of PRBs seem to be with chlorinated solvents. And again, the book and chapter by Gillum reviews quite a bit of this. Technology is licensed by environmental technologies, and I'm told that they have about 150 full-scale systems and 40 pilot-scale systems. That's a bit out of date, so I'm sure there's more. PRBs are not as commonly applied to petroleum hydrocarbons. And we'll talk about a few examples of those. I know of a few, but actually I don't know of all the ones that are going on. For example, the typical petroleum hydrocarbon PRB uses the PRB as a way to introduce electron acceptors into the system, oxygen or nitrate. 
And I know of four full scale and eight pilot scale applications, and we'll pick one or two of these to talk about. And of course, you can check the Clue In site, and it has a number of case histories and examples. Well, what are the approaches that we could use with permeable reactive barriers? Well, the simplest approach in many ways is a fence of wells through which we can add uh, chemicals uh, to the system. This is a relatively low cost operation. It'll have ongoing operation costs, which is not really desirable. And as you can see from this cartoon, the cutoff of the plume is imperfect. That is, unless we put the wells extremely close together, uh, some of the plume will escape between the wells and it'll take transverse dispersion down gradient to mix the additions from the well with the plume. That will occur, and if properly designed, the treatment zone is simply somewhat down gradient of the fence of wells. To overcome this problem of minimal transverse dispersion in aquifers, we could pulse the injection across two wells. That is, we would pump in to one well and withdraw from the other well, a slug of remedial chemical. Essentially, what we would do would be to replace the plume with a slug of remedial chemical that exists between those two wells. We would then allow that slug to migrate down gradient. The significant longitudinal dispersion would mix that slug with the adjacent plume segments that had passed be behind the uh, injection points without injection. And eventually we would get some overlap down gradient. This would develop a continuous zone of treatment where we had some contaminant and some remedial chemical at all times, typically useful for biodegradation. We can have reactive walls. This is perhaps the most common PRB type setup. The wall can be used simply to add chemicals, and the reaction can occur in the wall and down gradient of the wall. We initiate the reaction in the wall, but it's likely to be completed down gradient. Zero valent iron, on the other hand, requires the iron to be in contact with the contaminant, and since the iron is a solid, it only reacts with the contaminant in the wall. So if the reaction doesn't occur in the wall to completion, then the system is probably failing. Different designs of a layout. We can also have a funnel and gates. Uh, in that case, what we're doing, instead of putting the treatment zone across the whole plume, we're localizing the treatment zone by putting impermeable funnels in to direct the water in through the gate. This might be useful if the treatment system is very expensive. Trench and gate would occur in a system where there isn't as much permeability. So the problem isn't stopping the flow of water, it's actually gathering the water and dragging it towards the treatment system. And again, we could have an in-well initiation or an in-well reaction. The beauty of these systems are that they're very flexible and allow your imagination to run wild when you come up with designs. Designing the correct system for that site is, is really the trick. So what are we looking for when we come up with these designs? Well, it really should be easily constructed. Spending a lot of money up front on a very difficult construction is uh, really a turnoff in terms of the technology. The treatment should be robust. It's not something that you want to play with all the time. It should be quite passive so that it's not expensive. And the longer it lasts without significant maintenance, the cheaper it'll be. So those are sort of the desired features. Let's move on to the most common barriers, zero valent iron barriers. Again, these are used for treating chlorinated solvents. The elemental iron undergoes an oxidation in which water is reduced and uh, hydroxide ions and hydrogen gas are produced. The Zero valent iron can also react with chlorinated solvents. Chlorinated solvents, in fact, are very oxidized organic chemicals. So a reduction reaction is certainly possible. And in this case, the uh, reaction with iron causes dechlorination of the organic compound. Note that in these reactions, the pH increases. 
that's often viewed as a detriment. For example, iron 2 plus that's freed in the reaction precipitates, likely on top of the zero valent iron and might passivate or reduce its reactivity. And also we could get calcium carbonate to precipitate. Just being worried that uh, these sorts of precipitations will cause the technology to fail very quickly. Practical examples of field experience suggest really this isn't the case. These are still quite robust systems, even with these sorts of processes occurring. And again, you can check the Gillum reference for specifics. Well, the zero valent ion reaction is a bit complex. Uh, essentially, it involves a sequential dechlorination. We could go from tetrachloroethylene, PCE, to TCE, to DCE, to vinyl chloride, to ethene, and maybe ethane as well. For chlorinated methanes, again, the reaction is a hydrogenolysis where carbon tetrachloride goes to chloroform to dichloromethane. And then if we can get a two chlorine transfer, we can get methane formate and other uh, relatively innocuous chemicals. Rates have been published both in the uh, peer reviewed literature and in uh, practical studies by environmental and the rates tend to have wide ranges. In general, the more chlorinated the organic, the more oxidized the organic, the faster the zero valent iron dechlorination reaction. A number of designs are possible. And again, we've seen some of them, the continuous wall, funnel and gate, reaction vessels, various things like that, really up to the design imagination. Construction methods, again, because construction of many of these systems is expensive and, and challenging, a, a number of geotechnical considerations come into play, and the uh, choice of technology for construction really depends on the site-specific challenges. The zero valent iron design key is really to make sure that the, the contaminants are in contact with the iron for a long enough period for the reactions to be sufficient. And typically that is a complete dechlorination, removal of all the chlorinated hydrocarbons. Here's a picture of a typical test that environmental would do. It's a lab column experiment in which they put in the groundwater from the site. In this case, the TCE concentration is quite high, 10,000 micrograms per liter. The water already contains cis-DCE, but doesn't contain any vinyl chloride. They then follow the reaction as the water comes out of the column over time. You can see that the TCE decreases. The cis-DCE initially increases. Remember, it's a product of TCE dechlorination. Then it decreases. Sequentially, vinyl chloride now appears and increases, and then it decreases quite commonly observed that the control over the required contact time is not the disappearance of the main contaminant, in this case TCE, it's the disappearance of the products as well. So you can see that vinyl chloride is persisting beyond its maximum concentration limit for the longest. So its fate becomes the rate controlling step and the key design issue for the PRB. Contact time is critical, must have enough, very difficult to properly design. What concentration do we use for the start of this experiment? Well, we can use a sample of groundwater from the site. But remember, concentration distributions in plumes are always heterogeneous. Did we choose an anomalously high concentration and would come up with an over-designed barrier? Or an under-designed barrier if we had chosen a concentration sample that was quite low. Again, contact time is also controlled by the velocity of groundwater through the system. And again, velocity is heterogeneously distributed. Some parts of the system, the water might be going fairly quickly, other parts quite slowly. And experience suggests that we don't get much, much mixing in the barrier. So zones where groundwater is coming in at a high velocity seem to persist through the barrier, thus challenging the contact time requirement. So here's some cartoons of permeable reactive barriers. The one on the left is the typical zero valent iron concept uh, where we cut off the plume 
And the picture on the right is a funnel and gate system going in the ground. And we'll talk about those in subsequent lectures. That's all for now. Thank you.